All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this uh, April Conditions and Outlooks briefing. I'm Tony Bergantino, Director of the uh, Wyoming State Climate Office and the Water Resources Data System down here in Laramie, where it was a uh, nice sunny day in the morning, but it's uh, all of a sudden gotten fairly gloomy. Um, in addition to my office, this webinar is being presented by uh, USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub and University of Wyoming Extension, the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, State Engineer's Office, uh, National Weather Service, the Bureau of Reclamation, and the, uh, the National Weather, Sur Weather Service uh, River Forecast Center. And today we'll be looking at the uh, current drought and climate conditions, surface water conditions, uh, reservoir storage and operations. Uh, look forward with some uh, weather forecasts and outlooks. And after that, uh, Danelle Peck will give us an in-depth look at GrassCast, which is a, a very useful uh, production forecast tool. So we'll start off here in current conditions with the current uh, drought monitor map. Uh, this was just released this morning and shows where we're at as of uh, the 18th, uh, uh, this Tuesday. We're continuing to see some improvements as the snows melt and the benefits of the moisture are realized. Um, since our last webinar, we've seen improvements in the northern Bighorn Basin along the Montana border and then a fairly large chunk of improvement uh, down here in the southwest and, and western area going from uh, uh, D1 conditions into D0 for uh, quite, a, quite a large area. Uh, there's quite a few factors that are considered when producing recommendations for the drought monitor, and it's not just the precipitation. Uh, different factors are uh, weighed differently during different times of the year. Uh, snowpack is, is pretty important right now, but in the middle of summer, it's not too useful. Uh, stream flow and vegetation in February aren't really that important, but uh, so they carry a little weight, but will start becoming more important. Uh, data drive the drought monitor, but uh, descriptive or qualitative information is helpful when an area might be on the edge between categories. Uh, the data are usually considered in terms of medians and percentiles rather than uh, averages and uh, percentages, and the, the data are key. Uh, you have to be able to point to actual data to avoid subjectivity when, when making these determinations. And those, for those who might not be as familiar with the terms, since we have a few uh, additional extra people on today, uh, just a quick explanation of what the, what the medians and percentiles are. Um, unlike averages, which are uh, found by summing up all the values and dividing by however many there are, uh, a median is just the median value in a, in a sequence of numbers. So if you have, say, 15 observations of temperature, uh, you did sort those in order from the smallest to largest, and the median is just the middle or the uh, the eighth value. Um, percentiles are similar to percentages. Uh, they're found by determining where the value falls in a string of data. So for those uh, 15 temperature values I mentioned, that eighth value would be the median, but it's also at the 50th percentile. So you would expect you know half the values to be above that and half to be below it. Uh, if your number was, uh, say, the fifth of those 15, uh, then you would expect uh, 66% or two thirds of the values to be above that and one third to be below it. So you'd be at the 33rd percentile. So percentiles are usually used here because they give a, uh, a much better indication of frequency or the, the uh, expectation that a particular set of conditions will occur. So with that, let's jump to this timeline here, which is uh, we update this each time. It shows the percentage of Wyoming in each drought category from uh, from 2000 to now. And while it has declined over the last few months and then leveled off for a period, there is still some uh, D3 or extreme drought uh, still in Wyoming. And D3 has now been on the map. Uh, it's 144 weeks now that we've had some of that red on there in, in some part of the state. And as I said, it's remained fairly stationary the last, last several weeks. Uh, just over 30, actually 31% of the state is in the D1 to D4 level, which is actual drought. The D0 is not, uh, not considered drought per se, but rather uh, abnormally dry, sort of a, a heads up condition that your things are either getting worse or you're coming out of actual drought conditions. Uh, that 31, 31.3 actually percent is a decrease from uh, about 6.8 of uh, about 6.8 percent since the uh, the last webinar. So we continue to see the improvement overall um, since this is statewide. And you can see on that last map the, the differences across the state on what drought conditions might be in a particular area. We do produce these for the county level. 
And uh, the link on the slide will get you to there along with the, the statewide timeline. And those are, are updated weekly just after the, uh, the drought monitor map is released. Now zooming in on the last uh, three or so years showing from the start of tw uh, 2020, uh, coming up through present so that you can get a sort of an expanded view and a bit more detail on the, this last drought period. 1.28% uh, to be exact of the state is in extreme drought uh, right now. And uh, those of you with a good memory might recall that during the last webinar, the value was 1.29%. Uh, but before anyone breaks out the champagne over that one to one hundredth of a percent improvement, uh, the, the explanation is simply that I'm guessing there was a line shift or something when the maps were run this week. And so that decrease is not at all tied to, to any actual changes on the ground, but rather in the, in the map processing for the, the drought monitor. Uh, almost 45% of Wyoming now has no uh, no D category whatsoever, and almost 70% is in D0 or better, which is a um, a real nice change from uh, a year ago when 100% uh, of the state was D0 or worse, and uh, just around a little under 98% was in D1 or worse. So let's go over to uh, precipitation in itself. It's This is the 14-day total or the uh, the last two weeks worth of precipitation as a percentile, fairly dry over those last two weeks uh, across much of the state. Uh, some areas receiving median amounts uh, in the Northwest, or, uh, Eastern Sheridan County and a bit in the Southwest, and then the central area. Uh, Fremont County stands out as uh, having one of the largest areas of above median precipitation actually. Uh, much of the rest of the state was below the 20th percentile with these uh, red areas being in the, the 10th percentile or less. Uh, step backwards in time a little bit and look at it a longer period, uh, 90 day or three month uh, precipitation total. A uh, bit wetter at the 90 day time frame, but uh, still dry in the winds and then uh, seems perennially down here in the, in the southeast as well. Um, Look at the standardized precipitation index map or SPI. Um, these maps show the indices for the 30, 60 day timeframes across here on the top and then the one year down here on the bottom. And recall that these maps, uh, they show an index uh, value and not the actual precipitation amounts. These, these numbers here are indexes, not precipitation. Uh, some areas of concern emerging in the, in the Northeast and then uh, you can kind of see some other other areas around here where we're uh, getting these yellow and orange colors starting to, to show up a bit more. Uh, and you can see the intensity and area of the wetter values on the map has declined between the 60 and 30 day maps, indicating a bit of a drying taking place. And one positive thing in, in this sequence of maps is that the area of dryness down here in the southeast uh, present at at the one-year time frame and to a lesser extent at the 60 days is, is quite a bit diminished when you look at the shorter term indicating some improvement there. I'll switch over to temperature. These are the average minimum temperatures over the over that same period that we saw before, the two weeks. Um, here on the upper right, are, we're still below freezing with the lowest temperatures being in uh, the western quarter of the state, uh, a few other high elevation areas. Uh, the highest lows have been in the east and uh, across the lower elevation north. On the, the lower left, we have temperatures represented as a, as a departure from average, and you can see the greatest departures below average are down here in the southwest, up into Sublette County, reaching as much as, as uh, 15 degrees below average in, in parts of the, the Bear Basin here. Uh, the highest departures are a few isolated spots over here in Platte County, reaching about uh, up to a little over three degrees above average, uh, between three and six. Uh, going to the other end of the thermometer and looking at the maximum temperatures on the upper right again, we have the actual temperature, the thermometer temperature. Um, average high temperatures over the, the last two weeks across the entire state were, they were above freezing, though just barely in some spots. Uh, the upper green high elevation areas were the lowest, and then the southeast was the was the warmest with average high temperatures there being in the mid 60s. And uh, looking at it again in terms of the departure from average, we see pretty much the same stories with the low temperatures, great departures below average in the southwest. Uh, again, extending to as much as uh, 15 degrees below average uh, over that two week period. 
On the other hand, we have the Northeast and the, the, the Southeast. Um, a little bit, up the, maybe six degrees or so above average, basically the northern third of the state above average, uh, as was about the eastern, what is that, fifth or so thereabouts, and then the rest, to, rest here being uh, below average. You jump over to soil moisture, some improvements up in uh, the far north, northwest here, where you see some of this uh, 30th to 40th percentile sort of shifted downwards. Uh, we've gained some uh, some areas up here, a small area along the Montana border that's in the 60th to 70th percentile. But as you come down here into the central part of the state, this whole big area here that you saw two weeks ago in the 60th to 70th is uh, just a little bit of it left here. And then we have the expansion of these real low percentiles over here in the, the eastern part of the state where things are, are continuing to, to deteriorate. Uh, looking at snow, we're uh, Compared to the last two weeks, uh, we're losing snow everywhere, uh, but that's not really too surprising since uh, we're getting to that melt out period in, in many areas. So no, no great surprise there that we're gonna see this stuff getting, getting eaten off pretty quick here. Uh, looking at the uh, snowpack as a median by, you know, percent of median for each of the basins. Uh, every basin in the state is you know, either at or above 100% of median, uh, including the South Platte down here, which has been our, our little problem, uh, you know, going through the entire season. We've been below for most of the, most of the season. Uh, every basin is above where we were uh, last year when you compare it to the map over here. And I say, given now that we're past the point of the median peak snow water equivalent uh, for all, all but five basins, the Shoshone, Yellowstone, Bighorn, uh, tongue and wind uh, did not quite make to the uh, to the, uh, the they're not at their median peak snow water equivalent yet they've got a little ways to go uh, some of them just have maybe three or four days to go but some of them actually uh, get into May uh, at, at this point the curve on the snow water equivalent chart gets really steep as the melt off starts to take place so it, it doesn't take much of a shift uh, one way or the other from normal to start getting some really high or low percentages. And down there in the South Platte here in the last two weeks or so, I've seen that range from 75% of median all the way up to 125% of median. And some of those, some of those big jumps were just you know days apart because of the going back and forth across that, that line of where the actual uh, average is. Uh, let's see here, look at the uh, snowpack by basin. I've shown this table several times before. It's sort of just an update each time as we go along, but just wanted to point out a few items. Uh, and you can peruse this in greater detail by um, going down to the, the link here at the bottom left. Um, also note that you can uh, click any of the basins to get a history of the, this season's snowpack compared to last year, along with a, a trace of the max, min, and median values. And then you can also click on any of the yellow uh, image or IMG tags over here to bring up a, a chart of the particular uh, parameter in that column. That's either uh, median peak date, median peak uh, snow water equivalent, or the uh, the median melt out date. So just quickly looking at column six, well, we can see we have reached or exceeded the median uh, peak snowpack in all but the Tongue and South Platte basins, uh, barring any. Uh, future dumpings of snow, but uh, given the outlook, uh, there's a realm of possibility that we could reach it for the, the tongue, slim as it might be. And then just wanted to close off a little on, uh, well, we just came out of an extended La Nina uh, when the index uh, during the January to March timeframe rose above the, uh, the threshold that they would consider for La Nina conditions. So we are currently in uh, neutral, a neutral state but there's now about a 62% chance that by the May through July period that the index will go above the 0.5, which could move us into El Nino, which is obviously the opposite of La Nina and occurs when there is, uh, instead of, um, there's a, a weakening of the westerly trade winds. So you get less upwelling welling of water, uh, that deeper cold water off the west coast of the Americas. Uh, around the equator there. And so you get a pooling of warm water forming in the ocean there, as opposed to the, the cold water that forms there during La Nina. And then you also have the Pacific jet gets moved a little bit further south from its normal position. And so that moisture air over the Pacific causes, you know, caused by that uh, warm water, uh, 
with that, the southern part of the U.S. usually sees some um, uh, wetter conditions during the winter. And of course, much of that is dependent upon the strength of the particular El Nino. Uh, like I say they're not, not all created the same. And with some of the stronger episodes, uh, Wyoming during the winter usually has uh, above average temperature uh, with the, the, the magnitude of that uh, um, departure above average uh, increasing the farther north one goes. Uh, for precipitation in the winter, the Northwest might see a bit less than normal precipitation, but uh, precipitation in impact can be, can be fairly weak. For summer, generally normal, maybe tending a little bit to the cooler than average temperature wise, and maybe a bit more temperature uh, precipitation than average. And of course, all this is with the usual asterisks, you know, depending upon how far south the jet is displays, what the strength of the El Nino is. And, um, you know, not to mention that for this, at least for this coming center uh, uh, summer, if uh, El Nino does appear, it will have only just started. So the full impacts may not uh, really kick in for the summer. So. Just a, a little preview of some possible conditions to come. And so with that, we'll jump over to Aaron Fiaschetti with the USGS and he'll talk to us about surface water conditions. Aaron. Yeah, thanks, Tony. So here's a map from the National Water Information Dashboard. Uh, the, the dots show the green is a normal. So that's a range from the 25th percentile um, to the 75th. So it's just saying that it's normal for it to be kind of on the lower end of flow, the 25th percentile, and it's normal for it to be higher at this time. Um, and then, uh, so we, we have a mix of green here, and then we have uh, some higher flows above normal, the light uh, blue, that's above the 75th percentile. And then we have a few much above normals, uh, the, the dark blues. And then there's a uh, one one station in minor flood stage, and that's uh, um, Henry's Fork near Manila, down in the southwest corner. Um, and then there's kind of a, also a mixed bag of flows below normal, um, the the orange, and then we have a few that are setting a all time record for this day in the Upper Wind River, and then over um, in the uh, Snake River and then the, the boiling river up in the park. When you kind of surf around, at least to the flows that aren't tied to a reservoir um, in the upper wind river, those low values are tied to the recent cold snap and flows kind of locking down a little bit, things freezing back up. So, um, but it, it's not a kind of a good indicator of a kind of a, a drought status for those, those creeks. So if we uh, move on to the next slide. So this is a duration hydrograph for the entire state of Wyoming. So it's a compilation of all the different sites in the axis is in, uh, it's a seven day average runoff in millimeters. So that's, think of that as a precipitation over a land base and how much of that runs off. So the, the point of this hydrograph here is to kind of show you where we should be um, we're, we've come out of winter flows, the black line, and it has very similar percentiles to the, what I was talking about before with the green being the 25th to the 75th and the normal flow. And we're looking at the black line here. So we've, we're coming out of a uh, winter base flows and we're starting to see runoff from low elevation um, snowpack and uh, precipitation that falls on the plain. So we're, we're starting to come into a, a elevated, uh, water supply conditions um, throughout the state. But if the your water supply is tied to the prairie and lower elevations, it's very possible that the peak and high water has passed already. If it's a site located up in the mountains, independent on high elevation snowpack, uh, it still might be kind of locked up in winter conditions. And we haven't seen very much of the water supply pass by. Uh, there are still a few sites in ice, but in general, almost all of our sites are uh, showing data and are out of ice. Um, so, and uh, we're just kind of waiting on the snowpack to start melting and kind of get us into the point where we have a abundant water supply throughout the state. The next slide. So here's, um, here's an example of a high elevation site 
um, tied to high elevation mountains on the North Fork of the Shoshone. We could see we had some pretty low flows all winter long, that black line through January, February and into March. Um, and with that cool, persistent winter, um, just kind of kept things low, very low. And then we started to get a bit of a shot of runoff that uh, melted some snow, kind of peaked out a little bit. And then we see we kind of bump right back down with the, the cooler temperatures hovering around that 25th percentile right now. Um, so that's just kind of the state of high elevation streams in that, that northwest corner of the state. Moving over to the uh, northeastern part, these these hydrographs don't look as pretty because they're so variable when your water supply comes from lower elevations. But seeing here over on the Belfouche that um, we had flow through the winter um, that was showing in the normal conditions, but that normal could be almost to no flow on that uh, x-axis, so or y-axis. Um, and then uh, coming into February, March, we have that snow start to melt off the prairie um, and had some kind of a peak right there in March up into the much above normal. And then flows are starting to trend down. So um, as those the kind of expect flows without more snow or uh, more runoff to come off to start to trend down at that site to more normal conditions. Moving over to the uh, North Platte above Seminole Reservoir, um, you kind of see in coming into the winter period, we had normal conditions and then a little bit of a peak in February. And then we have a period of data that's not showing because of ice effect that uh, will be estimated. And then we kind of come in here into data starting to show again in mid April and uh, starting to see some, some runoff and some pretty good flows in that site, but um, still far from reaching a peak in waiting on higher elevation snow to start melting in that drainage, but things look pretty good down there. And then moving over to uh, Dinwiddie Creek. So that's showing an all time low for the day. Um, we got a pretty good period of record here from the 54 years. So, but that's just kind of a factor of flows were normal to close to the 75th percentile for most of the winter. So good flows had a period of ice effect that's not showing right there. And then uh, we started to see some runoff coming off here in uh, April, May from the lower elevation snow starting to melt or precip. And then um, it doesn't show that so much on the graph today, but uh, things locked up from the cool weather and uh, drove that uh, value down quite low um, in the last day. So I, I guess the point there is when you're looking at these maps that just show a dot on the line, it's always good to do a little bit more digging to see what's going on uh, with real time and provisional data. It's not always easy for us to kind of make those changes instantly to reflect the um, in, in it, you, there's always some more context there. So it might be a, an all-time low for today, but it's not a, an indicator of a, a bad situation right now. So moving on to uh, reservoirs, um, you know that there's some water starting to move around the state, some more abundant water supply, but overall between from uh, March to mid-April here, uh, we haven't seen a whole lot of change in reservoir contents. A few have gone down and a few have gone up, but they're pretty minor. They're only a couple percentage percentages. So not no big changes. I guess we'll expect that to change quite a bit. And I'm sure Liz will fill us in quite a bit more on that next. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. And speaking of Liz, next is Liz Cresta with the US Bureau of Reclamation to talk about those reservoir operations. Yep, I'm Liz Cresto with the Wyoming Area Office. We cover the Bighorn Basin and the North Platte Basin. So starting off with the Bighorn Basin, you can see our um, a table of Bull Lake, Buffalo Bill, and Boysen content, capacity, percent full, and percent of average. The overall picture is that we're 68% full in our reservoirs and right at average or 102% of average. Next. 
So every the beginning of every month, we do runoff forecasts for the April through July runoff period. And that's, of course, when we get the majority of our water supply in our rivers is in that April through July timeframe. For Buffalo Bill, we're expecting 750,000 acre feet of runoff or 100% of average. Poison, we're expecting the same volume of 750,000 acre feet, which is above average at 123% of average. On the right, you'll see a schematic of our reservoir system and our releases. So right now we're releasing 1,450 CFS from Buffalo Bill, 3,000 CFS from Poison Reservoir, and 43 CFS from Bull Lake. Just want to mention, we did some flushing flows. Buffalo Bill had a, about a week of flushing flows last week that concluded, and then Earlier in April, we did a one day flush from Boysen Reservoir. And those are both those flushes are at the request of game and fish. Next slide. Next, I wanted to talk about our upcoming reservoir releases for Buffalo Bill, which is shown on the top, and Boysen shown on the bottom. This is our monthly average planned releases. And I, I mentioned our forecast. Um, one number for our forecast, but we actually do um, a range for our forecast for, from a reasonable minimum. So if conditions dry out, what we expect to a reasonable maximum. So if we get wetter conditions, this is um, what you'll expect from our reservoir releases. And in general, for both Buffalo Bill and Boysen, we're expected to fill those reservoirs, but as we're filling those reservoirs and the spring runoff increases, we'll be stepping up the outflows from um, both of those reservoirs um, throughout the spring. And of course, if they think conditions dry out, we'll, we'll back off those releases. But we do post online, what our um, reservoir releases are gonna be, and those can change anytime throughout the month. So I encourage you to go check out that website for the latest information of our planned reservoir releases. Next, we'll switch over to the North Platte side of things. The North Platte is going off of a series of consecutive dry years. And as you see in that bottom um, left, table, the reservoir contents, capacity, and percent of average. The system as a whole is just 45% full or 83% of average. And then on the upper right, you see our April through July runoff forecasts. And the total runoff forecasts for the basin, we're expecting 1.15 million acre feet or a little above average for um, the North Platte system. But given that we're at low reservoir contents, um, I thought I'd show in the next slide, instead of showing our reservoir releases, this slide shows our um, end of month reservoir contents under those reasonable maximum, most probable and minimum forecast plans. And the overall story there is that both Seminole and Pathfinder, which are our biggest reservoirs on the North Platte system, we don't anticipate that even though we're having above average runoff conditions, we don't anticipate filling the overall system. But we do expect to have an adequate irrigation supply. Next um, slide. This is just our current releases on the North Platte. So starting upstream, 2,600 CFS from Miracle Mile, 450 from Gray Reef, 1,200 from Glendo, and 1,000 from Guernsey Reservoir. And of course, we are entering into the irrigation season as well as the spring runoff season. I expect these flows out of the um, releases made out of the reservoirs to change throughout um, the irrigation season. And again, there's that website where you can look for um, changes to our releases. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Liz. Thanks. And now getting us into forecasts and outlooks, we have Jared Allen with the National Weather Service over in Cheyenne. Jared. 
Thanks, Tony. Appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone. Jared Allen with the National Weather Service here in Cheyenne. I'm part of the five offices that do cover the state of Wyoming. Uh, so not too bad of an outlook over this next week. Here's our seven day total precipitation forecast. Uh, we've got some ongoing snow showers starting to develop this afternoon across decent portions of the state. Um, just looking over at a radar right now. Uh, not going to be too concentrated in any one particular area. Uh, however, we're going to see those continue through the day tomorrow, uh, Friday, and then a little bit into Saturday as well. Uh, and then we'll have a little bit break on Sunday, and then we're going to be looking at another precipitation chance across portions of the state on Monday and Tuesday. Uh, so overall, uh, good and healthy totals. We see some greens, uh, which is always good. Uh, we need to keep them down a little bit so that the snow totals don't get too much higher than they have been already, especially in the mountains for how much snow water equivalent is up there. Uh, but you can see the mountains highlighted pretty well on this image. So you got the big horns up in north central looking at at least a quarter to maybe upwards of 1.5 inches of a liquid water equivalent. Further to the west, uh, towards the northwest portions of the state, a little bit less, but again, the higher elevations of the Absorcas and the Wyoming range near the Tetons uh, certainly look to pick up at least a half inch, uh, maybe over an inch uh, in the very tip top of those elevations. Uh, Wind River range is highlighted as well about 0.5 to upwards of an inch in the higher terrain. And then just south of there and kind of in the high desert, uh, gonna be a little bit less, maybe only a trace to a 10th across Sweetwater County, uh, but then kind of moving further to the south and east. Again, the snowies in the Sierra Madres, higher elevations looking to perform better. And then a little bit pocket of here in the Southeast, which is where Tony was highlighting some additional drought conditions earlier. Uh, we'll continue to see if we can whittle away that a little bit more. Uh, with upwards of maybe a half inch to three quarters of an inch uh, for the southeast portions of the state in the high plains. Uh, a little bit less in the northeast portions, uh, but overall uh, some green on the map and we'll, we'll take any type of good spring moisture that, that we can take for sure. Uh, if we go ahead to the next slide, uh, we're going to then take a quick look. Uh, here's kind of some new graphics that we've put together. Uh, basically a quick large overview of some larger population centers across the state. Uh, so kind of find your place or close to your place. And then you can just kind of looking at the colors overall. So we're kind of in a, a colder period right now with those blues and, and teal colors. Uh, but then you can kind of see going into Sunday, Monday, and then portions of next week, we're going to be warming up into the 50s and 60s across the good portions of the state uh, as well. So that's going to kind of transition us a little bit. Uh, down at the bottom, you can kind of see all those different locations kind of having chances of snow. Uh, and the predominant precipita precipitation type being snow. Uh, then they mentioned that nice break on that Sunday where you have pretty low probability of precipitation being uh, possible. And then going into early next week, we start to see the return of precipitation uh, for the most part, especially if you're below say 7,000 feet, uh, maybe even 6,000 feet. It's primarily gonna be rain, liquid rain, uh, which it would be a nice treat uh, where you kind of see those green colors. Uh, but in a few spots where you do see the blue uh, or kind of a mix, so to speak, rain snow mix uh, in certain spots as well. So we've got a, a decent amount of probability for some snow over the next couple of days in the in the afternoons primarily, and then picking up again into early to mid next week. And then if we want to move forward uh, for the next slide. Uh, we're then going to start to take a look at the extended range, six to 10 day uh, temperature and precipitation outlook. So this is going to be valid for April 25th through the 29th. Uh, kind of separated half of the state uh, to the west is going to be near normal, equal chances of near normal temperatures. Uh, however, on the further east you go, especially far east, uh, it's a slightly stronger signal for below normal temperatures where uh, we're still going to get some potential cold shots uh, coming down from Canada obviously with the, the upper Midwest being much more favored, uh, but the, the central and then high plains will uh, kind of squeak out uh, some of those colder temperatures coming down the plains. And then switching onto the right side of the graphic for precipitation, kind of the same deal, uh, kind of split down the middle with near normal for central Wyoming, favored a little bit more for higher precipitation on the east where those cold fronts are gonna try and bank up against the Laramie mountain range and that upslope flow. Uh, and then the farther west you go, slightly below normal precipitation uh, for western portions of the state. And then on the next slide, we'll just kind of shift forward in time just a little bit. So the 8 to 14 day outlook from April 27th through May 3rd. Again, 
We're still in the blue. <laughs> the blue has been very persistent this winter. We've definitely had a very cold winter across the state. And we're going to kind of stay in that pattern a little bit as we close out the month of April. Uh, so we still favored a little bit below normal temperature wise. Uh, but again, this isn't bad. I know we want warm temperatures, but this isn't bad because this will actually kind of help uh, slowly release some of that snow pack that's up there in the mountains. We don't want it to come out uh, all at once or too soon. Uh, one for, for all, obviously the water supply, but two for flooding concerns as well. So we'll see if we can find that fine line of releasing it in the, in the right way in the right time. Uh, as far as the precipitation outlook, uh, near normal pretty much across the entire state and kind of the Intermountain West uh, for that time period. And then if we just scroll forward one more, uh, we'll just take a hot off the press actually from today, three month temperature outlook and precipitation outlook. Uh, near equal chances pretty much for the entire state for the months of May, June and July combined. So again, this is an average of the three months together. So will we have periods of above normal temperatures? Probably. Will we have periods of below normal temperatures? Also probably. Will the average out based off this equal chances are yes. Uh, the greater chances of above normal temperatures definitely further to the south and east in, in portions of the country. As far as the precipitation goes, kind of the same deal, equal chances for the vast majority of the state. I guess if you go the furthest to the northwest and especially Montana, Idaho, you start to get a slightly below normal signal up that direction for uh, the bulk of the summer months um, as well. So equal chances for the most part for Wyoming across temperatures and for precipitation for the months of May, June, and July. However, we will have to continue to monitor for the snow melt runoff, uh, which there is ample amount of snow liquid water equivalent up there. And then if there's any potential rain on snow events, that certainly could uh, help or, or create some flooding impacts that we'll have to be monitoring for from the weather service side. So certainly monitor latest rain gauges, uh, river gauges, and some of the, the latest watches and warnings if there's any across the state uh, for any rapid melt uh, that could be possible during this time frame. Um, yeah, so that's kind of the main gist of everything right there. One of the last components, we did have a question come in previously that I wanted to, to address. Let me just pull up the question here really quick. The question was following a wet winter, what weather patterns can producers in Wyoming expect through the spring summer months? Should we gear up for another hot, dry spring summer? And I was looking at some statistics a little earlier. So whenever you have like a triple uh, La Nina going into more of a neutral and then maybe even weak El Nino that Tony was talking about earlier, uh, triple La Nino's, um, sorry, triple La Nina's going into neutral conditions, the summers actually tend, and there's only two instances that have occurred uh, going back through the whole database of 19, through 1950. Uh, and those two years, 1976 and 1957. And those were like basically near average summers. Uh, 76 was only 0.2 degrees warmer than normal and 57 was 0.3 below normal. So pretty, pretty even for, for both of those uh, as well. So I would say just based off those two analog years and going into the summer, maybe expect a near normal summer. Uh, again, there's gonna be some hot periods. There's gonna be some colder periods. But overall, they should average out over that three uh, to four month time frame. And then I'll turn it back over to Tony and the and the next speaker. All right, thank you, Jared. And that next speaker is Kevin Lau with the River Forecast Center to get into some flood potential. All righty, thank you, Tony, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kevin Lau. I'm also with the National Weather Service. Uh, I'm out of the River Forecast Center that takes care of the Missouri Basin portion of Wisconsin, but I will also talk about uh, the Columbia Basin and the Colorado as well. So this map shows the flood potential uh, over the next three months. So basically mid-April through mid-July, uh, even though the title says April, May, June, uh, we made our last run about a week ago, so it actually spills over into July. But basically the next 90 days, what locations will we see going to flood? And of course, the driver of these uh, is the higher elevation snows that have not started uh, to melt, but will, um, of course, uh, later on. And usually uh, the runoff, the crests that we see along the streams occur 
in late May, early June. And so in the Missouri portion of the basin, we are expecting because of the uh, um, uh, greater than, than median snow pack in the North Platte Basin, we are expecting minor flooding. That's what the orange squares there are. Uh, minor flooding along the North Platte in the Saratoga to Sinclair reach. Again, that would be uh, first part of June probably would be the best uh, estimate of when those crests would occur. Um, we are also looking at uh, uh, Poposia. Um, we don't have a forecast point on that, but there are some flooding concerns along uh, the Poposia as well. Looking into the uh, Colorado Basin, uh, my colleagues over in Salt Lake City that run the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center there, they are concerned about the uh, Little Snake River uh, there toward the south there, and also uh, the Bear River, uh, the Bear River. And there's not a location there that's highlighted, and I don't really know why, but um, <laughs> but there should be a square there with, a, with an orange color. But uh, the Bear River, I believe, near border. I believe that's the location. They are expecting minor flooding along that um, along that stretch of the Bear uh, come late May, early um, June. And other than that, uh, I believe that's pretty much the flood concerns uh, that the National Weather Service has for river locations. Of course, with as much snow as we've got, uh, there's going to be some lowland flooding, uh, some localized flooding at places that we would not uh, be able to monitor. And so um, uh, please stay tuned, as Jared mentioned, stay tuned to your local uh, weather forecast offices, watches and warnings with regard to uh, uh, stream flow and, and low-lying area flood, flood concerns. The link, uh, you can see this map, you can get updates to this map by going to the very uh, bottom link on this screen. You can go there whenever you want to, and you can see this as it updates. Again, it updates at least once a month, sometimes more often. And then the um, National Weather Service did issue its, its spring flood outlook back on March the 16th. And you can go to that middle link there that's, uh, that Tony is, is uh, putting the mouse over. You can go there, some of that data some of that information uh, is already a bit outdated uh, because it was issued in, in a month ago, uh, but that is the, the uh, official overlook for the nation, not just Wyoming, but for the whole nation as far as flood potential this spring. And I think that concludes my points. So thank you, Tony. Thanks, Kevin. And now this month for our, our featured product, we have Danelle Peck, who is the, uh, the director of the Northern Plains uh, Climate Hub. And she's gonna talk to us about grass casts. So all yours, Danelle. Great, thank you, Tony. Go ahead and take us to that next slide. For those of you, in case you haven't heard of grass cast or it's been a whole year since you've heard about grass cast, it's the grassland productivity forecast. And I wanna give you just a quick sense um, to begin with, what is it in general? So this is just an example map of grass cast on the left. And you look and you find whatever location you're interested in and you look at the color. And that color is telling you that based on the weather we've observed um, from past years, all the way up to the date that the map was made, that observed weather, plus some future weather scenarios um, based on those two things, we expect grassland productivity in your area to be some percent higher or lower than what is average for your local area. So that's just in general how we're going to interpret grass cast. But at the next slide, I'll walk you through the current set of maps. So uh, grass cast just started coming out here in April. Uh, it kind of takes a, a winter nap and uh, it's back. And this is the second set of maps we've released for this year. I've gone ahead and selected um, you know, a location of interest, in this case, kind of Southeast Niobrara County. Uh, and you find your location in each of the three maps. And again, look at the colors. I'm gonna start on the left. Uh, again, we talk about possible scenarios for, for the future. Um, so I'm gonna start in the left. And what this left map is telling us is, based on the weather that we've observed up to the date that these maps were made, which was just a couple of days ago, um, if the rest of the growing season has above normal precipitation, 
then this area is, is kind of in this bluish color. And that bluish color is telling us that if we get that above normal precip between now and the end of the growing season, that that area should expect about 15 to 30% more pounds per acre than they normally have. I hope that comes true, but what if it doesn't? Uh, so what are some other scenarios? We move to the middle map, the same location, and the color is more yellow. This middle map is saying, you know, what if we don't get that lucky? What if we, we just get kind of near normal amounts of precipitation from now until the rest of the, the end of the growing season? How much grass are we likely to grow out there on our rangelands? Yellow means um, that if we, even if we get near normal amounts of precip, we are gonna expect five to 15% less pounds per acre than normal. So even we have near normal precip, it's not gonna translate into near normal amounts of grass. Unfortunately, it's gonna be a five to 15% less pounds per acre. And then finally kind of, ugh, we don't wanna think about it, but what if the spigot turns off from today through the rest of the growing season and we have below normal amounts of, of precip, how bad might it get? This same area is kind of a mix of oranges and reds. I'm gonna be optimistic and go with the orange and explain what orange means because uh, there's quite a bit of it on the map. This means that again, if that spigot turns off, the rest of the growing season is dry, that this area should be prepared for 15 to 30% less pounds per acre out on their, out on their range lands. So this is the most recent map that we have available for grass cast. Um, we do update these maps every two weeks. And so in a minute, I'm gonna show you the website, but I encourage you to, to kind of check this website regularly. In particular, you'll notice that these early maps have really wide range of possibilities, right? Again, depending on when we roll that dice, you know, what kind of precip are we gonna get for the rest of the growing season? It, so when you go to the website, there is a zoomable map that you can go and find your specific location and look up a little bit more specifically, what are those estimates, right? The ones that I gave you on the previous slide were pretty broad ranges, 15 to 30% less, it's a big range. Um, so you can go to the website, you can find your location in the zoomable maps. It will give you more specific estimates for the three maps, um, the three scenarios. Again, this is, uh, I clicked here again on Southeast Niobrara because I've got my eye on it. Um, again, if we get lucky, have good precip, we might have, you know, 20 per, 22% um, plus or minus pounds per acre. Uh, if we have near normal amounts, like Jared, um, you know, kind of explained, maybe we'll, we'll get lucky and be in the near normal amounts, that middle map, then this area of Niobrara County should still expect slightly less than average growth. Um, if it turns off, we get unlucky and the whole, the whole season is dry, you know, they should be prepared. They should have a plan. What would they do if they had, you know, 34% less pounds per acre out there for their livestock to graze? So again, check out the GrassCast website. You can go to the zoomable map to find your local area. Um, you can also zoom back out and look at the whole region and uh, get a sense for if, you know, if your worried conditions might not be good in your area, how far would you have to go to find better conditions? Um, one thing I wanna note before we leave this slide, GrassCast is talking about total production, total grass, you know, kind of the total height of your grassland or rangeland production. And so you imagine, you know, however tall it normally gets, um, you know, if you had 34% less of that, uh, picture what that would look like. That's the change in total production. Now, for those of who, who graze livestock, you know that quite a bit of that grass, you don't, you don't wanna use it all in grazing. You usually are trying to leave some stubble behind to help protect that soil. So imagine taking all, you know, all of your grass and leaving half of it for the environment and then taking a portion of that for your, your grazing livestock. So when GrassCast says that there might be 34% less pounds per acre, that's of the total. That's before accounting for how much you wanna leave for um, soil health and, and cover. So really, if you're um, you know, managing grazing uh, that way, this estimate of loss, this 34% loss of total production translates into a much larger percent of grazable forage that's that's likely to be lost. So this 34% might actually be closer to 60 or 70% reduction in the grazable portion 
of your forage. So just a kind of a complicated note, but an important one when it comes to using this for management. Go ahead, Tony, next slide. I just wanted to end here with, uh, again, kind of getting rid of the, the pop-out boxes so you could see what's going on more regionally. Um, again, we're seeing over on that right map when it's early like this in the season, I'm just looking for, for big areas that show up as oranges and yellows, either in that right map or in the middle map. So I kind of focus on those two and look for areas that look like they might be in trouble even if we get near normal amounts of precip. Um, so for me, again, kind of looking at Southeast Niagara County, portions of Laramie County, there's some yellows um, popping in the middle map. Um, and then going back up north, kind of some spots in central Johnson County, parts of Weston County. So it's early. We'll update, update these maps in two weeks as we've observed more and more of the actual um, you know, weather. And we'll start to hone in on, on you know, what these estimates might actually be by the time we, we reach the peak of the growing season. With that, Tony, I think I saw a quick question roll in about why, why some areas are grayed out um, and not available. A couple of things are possible. Grass cast was really developed for grassland systems. When we start to get into too much heavy shrubland or tree cover, uh, the technologies that we're using to develop this product no longer work there. Uh, so sometimes that's the reason there might be too, you know, too much shrub cover or tree cover. Um, the other possibility is that there are some parts of the state um, where one of the pieces of the data that we need uh, might be missing. So that might be NDVI um, or some weather data that for whatever reason might be missing um, during this time. All right. I think that's all I have, Tony. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Danelle. So I guess with that, uh, I'd like to, to thank my fellow presenters of Aaron Piacetti, Liz Cresto, Jared Allen, Kevin Lau, Danelle Peck, and, and of course, Wendy Kelly, who has the task of organizing the webinar and making sure everything goes off without a hitch. And I'll turn it over here, over to her now to, to get us into Q&A.